Hey everyone. So just a couple of things before I get going. Uh, this is a fairly technical talk and I'm happy for people to kind of put their hands up as I'm going through and, and I'll try and get to the questions right there and then. Um, but we've got a relatively short period of time so I'll try and get through it all, do the demos and then still have some time uh, for some questions at the end. So my name's uh, Justin Randall. Um, Drupal.org IRC and Twitter is Pajibus. Um, and I've just recently, um, just recently starting at Acquia as a, a cloud hosting developer. So who's used Node.js? Who, who knows what Node.js is? OK, so all right, that's not too bad. Um, so I want to give a little bit of a brief outline. Um, so Node.js is basically JavaScript on the server. So I probably, I mean, probably most people in this room have written JavaScript to run in, in a web browser. Um, one of the nice things about Node is that it's um, JavaScript that will run uh, on the server side. It's based on Google's V8 engine. Um, if people don't know, that's um, the engine that they use in their Chrome uh, browser to, to, to run JavaScript. Um, one of the awesome side effects of that is that there are JavaScript wars going on in browsers, so that kind of just gets better over time. Uh, and Node.js just kind of benefits from that. Uh, it's event driven, um, and we'll go into this in more detail, but people are probably familiar with the concept of writing JavaScript that will um, respond to something happening, clicking on a button or you know, any of the other sort of events that you might be used to uh, in JavaScript. There's a lot of that model in the server side code uh, in Node.js. Uh, and by default, when you're doing something that is I.O., whether it's over the network or on a disk, um, Node wants you to do it uh, in an async fashion. In other words, hey, go and do something, and then when you're done, come back and let me know, and I'll, I'll respond at that time. So you can actually do blocking um, I.O. with Node, but you actually have to kind of go out of your way and, and make a call that will have like a, a sync thing at the end of the method, uh, the method name. So you know you, you can do that if you want to, but by default, Node doesn't want you to do that. Um, so it's it's highly optimized to do I/O without blocking. That's one of the key um, things that makes Node what it is. Um, and lots of people love it. There's a, like quite a lot of um, people getting into it. It's grown really quickly. It's it's moving forward. It's and it's got a company behind it. Um, go and check out that link if you want to. Not everyone loves it. Some of the some people think it's um, overhyped or not very good or whatever. And I, I, a lot of the reason why I bring this up is there is uh, a fair portion of people who are, yay, let's do Node for everything. Or I've given this talk and some people have said, why, why wouldn't we port Drupal to Node.js? Um, which is kind of the other end of the spectrum. Um, and so even though I'm advocating its use here, it's, it's not something that's just like, going to solve all your problems. It's got a really good set of strengths, but it's also got a lot of weaknesses. Um, and so it's not the right tool for everything. So some more information about it. Node.js typically um, you'll run, it's, it's a single process, but it's multi-threaded. Uh, a lot of people say Node.js is single-threaded, but they're, they're really sort of um, mixing up um, some of the more details of it. It's, but, uh, it's actually a multi-threaded um, single process model. Um, the thing that is kind of the, where the single, it's single threaded comes from usually is because the main event loop is, is a single thread. Um, and it really is kind of what you might think it is. If you do something dumb in the main event loop, everything stops until that dumb thing is finished. Um, so you have to be very careful when you're, when you're programming with Node that you don't do something dumb in the main, in the main thread, otherwise everything blocks. It's kind of not like Apache where you might have some PHP that's doing something really dumb and you've got a whole bunch of Apache children. That Apache child process is kind of hosed until that's finished, but all the other ones are still fine. They're all separated. Um, and there are other models, thread, threaded models, where you know, one thread doing something stupid is not going to hose everything. But in Node.js, if you do something dumb in the main event loop, you, you're, you're toast until that's finished. 
a bit like PHP. Um, if you know how to write C in PHP, you can write an extension to optimize something or to you know incorporate a light, do make some bindings for a library. Uh, Node.js is a really nice kind of module model. So if you know C++, you can write bindings for for you know C libraries or C++ libraries or do something that you really want to have happen at a lower level um, and extend it beyond JavaScript. But it's the same sort of trade-offs as you might expect. It's a much easier if you can just do it in JavaScript. And if you can do it in JavaScript, you should, just like in PHP, where really if you can do it in PHP, you should, um, because going to C has much higher costs in terms of maintenance, et cetera. The other thing I'll throw in, and it's kind of, it's a completely separate project. So in, in Drupal equivalents, um, Socket.io is like a contrib module, uh, and Node.js is like Drupal core. Um, but it's often used, there's a few sort of very popular modules um, and Socket.io is one of them. And the reason why I raise it is because what I use Node.js for with the, the Drupal module is all about um, web sockets uh, and, and web browsers. And what Socket.io does is takes kind of the pain out of the emerging web socket technology. So uh, web sockets is, is something which is implemented in, in at various levels in different browsers. Um, and so support for it can be kind of annoying. So Socket.io just basically gives you WebSocket type functionality where pretty much you know any browser that you can think of is supported um, where it'll fall back from WebSockets to other transports. Um, it also actually adds a few things on top that are not part of the WebSocket spec. Um, so it's more than that, but the main thing people use it for is you can just drop it in and it'll, you can get WebSocket-like functionality in, in any browser. So why? Like, what, why did I delve into all this? Uh, I love Apache. I don't hate Apache at all. Um, I just want to say that up front. Um, this is not, not to bash Apache, but um, one of the problems with Apache is that usually you'll have, like, a logical thread, it's usually a process for, for PHP um, for a connection. Um, and in a lot of cases, if you've got a PHP interpreter, and then in Drupal's case, a whole lot of code, uh, in each one of those, it's quite, it's quite memory heavy. So um, it's, it's, you don't want any of those processes to be doing anything except handling a request, crunching some numbers, and then letting go and then moving on to the next one. It's the only way to work with them efficiently or to get good value out of them. But the problem when you have a model where instead connection is going to connect to your server and then just hang there waiting for something to happen is that that big fat memory intensive process is just sitting there doing nothing. So if you want to use a, a push model which is the right way to do things like chat and real-time notifications in most cases, you're going to end up with a situation where your Apache children in a lot of cases are just sitting there waiting, <laughs> waiting for something to be pushed into them um, to, to go down to a client. So it really is not something that you can scale. Uh, and I know this from bitter experience because uh, I maintain the chat room module uh, and it really sucks. Um, because it's basically trying to work uh, on the LAMP platform as is. You don't need anything else, you just need a standard LAMP platform and you can have chat. And the way it does that is polling. And of course that really, really doesn't scale because you can either then make every client poll every second and then it's kind of crappy but it's not too bad. You kind of get responsiveness. But then as soon as you get more than 100 or 200 or 1,000 clients, you're just hammering your server and you're not even serving web pages. All, all that's happening is just there's a page sitting there just uh, eating your server. Um, so I was actually thinking about Drupal 7 and chat room and what I wanted to do um, that finally led to me to just go, no, nah, I'm not going to port this forward without having a better way to do the persistent connection part. So uh, having gone through that's some of the things that no, uh, Apache's not so good at. Um, Node.js is really good at this stuff because one thing that'll happen when you open up a connection to, to Node.js, if nothing's happening, it'll just kind of puts it in the background and the main thread just keeps on doing its thing 
And it's not until something is interesting has happened, like, oh, here's some, some data, you can write down that socket um, that actually gets woken up, does its thing, and then goes back again. Um, so, and it's also, that's kind of built in. It's really easy to write code that works that way uh, with Node. So I've talked about asynchronous I.O. Um, and again, here I chose Node. I had to look at a few other things like uh, Twisted. Um, there's some libraries in Ruby, uh, which is a Python library. There's some things in Ruby which are the same, but they all, you, you kind of, you write your code and then you explicitly kind of say, hey, this is evented now and this is how, this is how it's gonna work. It's a little bit more overhead in, in Node.js, that's just implied. So you write a whole bunch of code, Node will run through it, if there's nothing that's going to wait, that's, that's a future event, no, just returns. Um, because it's totally implied that you're going to go into an event, event loop. You don't, there's no, you don't have to like, do that explicitly and make sure that you do it correctly, otherwise it's not going to work. That's just implied. Um, and that's the way a node program will run. Uh, okay, kind of already said that. Um, and it's really good f uh, for that reason, for networking, um, applications, if you've got a web service over here and a web service over there and Drupal over here, it's really, really easy to write a lightweight server process that might authenticate off one and then grab some data off another. Um, and that's, that's actually one, kind of a lot like what the Drupal Node.js module does and I'll, I'll explain that. But if you do need to glue together different network services, um, Node.js is very, very um, quick and easy um, to, to write that sort of application. So how do we stick it all together? So Node.js module, it's on drupal.org. Um, if you haven't seen it, go and check it out. Um, and it basically provides a, a chunk of code that'll run in a no, on a Node.js server. Uh, and then a node, uh, a module in, in, in Drupal, which is just a standard PHP module with some standard JavaScript that kind of glues it all together. Uh, and I'll go through some code samples and how your modules can hook into that um, later on in the talk. And it's really about plumbing. So there's some extra on top that's provided when you, when you go to the Node.js uh, module on Drupal.org. There's some nice little things, I'll demo them. But really, uh, the intention is for this to be plumbing so that other people can write cool stuff where they don't have to focus on how do I make this happen in real time and scale, et cetera. They can just use these APIs uh, and plug them in. So here's a bit of a, bit of a diagram and you know, hopefully um, it'll make things a little clearer. But the basic setup is, is a bit of a triangle. So in the first step, you're gonna have a normal page load, just like any, any other Drupal uh, page load down to some device, phone, uh, client, whatever. And then the client using some JavaScript will connect to Node.js uh, and send up uh, an auth token. Now one of the like, design goals here is that Node.js is dumb. Nothing happens unless Drupal says yes. No content is generated in Node. No content is stored in Node. Everything is about Drupal saying yes, no, how high, everything. So on the first request, Node is gonna check that token with Drupal. And, and this token has, has a life cycle like a session cookie. Um, and it has very, very similar strength and, and life cycle. Um, as, as a session cookie, if Drupal says yes, then it'll return a list of channels. So channels are just kind of like um, PubSub, it's like just a named pipe that uh, messages will be sent into and your auth token is associated with a list of channels which Drupal controls. And if you're not in one of those channels, you don't see the messages. So all of the control is with Drupal. Um, nothing, Node.js makes no decisions about that, it just gets the data from Drupal. And that, the three and four is like a back channel. So that's um, via, via like an API key but that's shared between the Node.js pr um, process and Drupal and never sent down to the client. And in most cases, I would expect that to be like, uh, like fi at the firewall level protection as well. There's no need to expose that back channel in any way um, to, the, to a client. And then Node.js gets the yes from Drupal, so it'll send something down and you're then, you're then happy. You've got 
both a, a socket and you've got the OK from Drupal. And we'll, there are some uh, JavaScript events you can hook into at that point. So uh, pretty much every point in this um, diagram is, is hookable into from Drupal, JavaScript, or PHP code. So for example, if you wanted to have some JavaScript code that changed something in the UI when your socket was successfully opened, uh, that's, you, you can do that because you get notified. So the other thing, just in case everyone is worried about that last diagram, is that on subsequent page requests, and again, this has a, a cycle like a, a session cookie, we don't actually hit Drupal. So otherwise, we would basically be bootstrapping Drupal twice for every page, which would really suck. So instead, for the life cycle of that login, when, when subsequent page requests go down, Node.js goes, oh, I've seen that before. You're all good and doesn't need to hit Drupal. Um, so that only happens once. Um, I've got another diagram here. I might, I've got less time than the last time I did this, so I might skip through, but it's basically another way of illustrating uh, what happens. Some people like these diagrams better than the other sort of diagram. Um, but again, the first time Node.js sees an auth token, it's going to send it to Drupal, get a yes or no. In subsequent, um, in subsequent uh, socket open from a client to Node.js, it, it knows you're OK, uh, and it doesn't hit Drupal. So as I said, all of this is plumbing. And what, I'd, what I'm trying to do is get more people to build real-time applications with Drupal, where they can do all the normal, powerful stuff in Drupal uh, and do the real-time connection stuff uh, in Node.js to try and get the best of both worlds. So I'm going to go through a little bit of like, how easy it is. So when you've got Node.js module installed, that's it. That is how you send a message to clients. Um, from your module code, you just, it's just a sort of very typical um, data structure for a message. A channel is required. Um, if you want it to go to just a particular channel for, for clients that are associated with a the channel, there's a data key and then that's arbitrary. So everything inside data can be whatever you want to put in there. As long as your JavaScript understands it at the other end, we don't care. Node will just send it down and it'll arrive as JSON, uh, which you, it's just obviously very easy to deal with. So if you have some, something that happens via cron, via, so, and I'll show some demos later, somewhere where like a page is updated and you want to send a notification out to people that a page has been updated or a comment's been posted or a use has been added or whatever, right? You're, it's Drupal developers, you know that you can hook into all sorts of other processes. And if you want to send a message out to all connected clients, you're done. That's it. Um, you can also hook into the JavaScript. So you might actually not care about any of the PHP side of things, um, but you might have just some code that enhances a, a front end, and you want to resp re respond to messages. And that's it as well. Um, it's kind of borrowed straight from Drupal core, whether you love it or hate it, the pattern is to have uh, an object which is iterated over. So if you are example module, you hook into the Drupal Node.js callbacks object and add your own um, element on it, and then have a, like, set up a callback just like that. And for every client that's connected that has access to um, that message, you get it. And here, I'm just, just going to alert, but again, it's it's just whatever you can do in JavaScript um, is, is what you can do in the body of that callback. Now, um, there's two. When you um, send down a message to the client, uh, you can also specify a single JavaScript callback. Um, if, you, if you just say nothing, um, then it'll iterate over all of the callbacks and give them, give them a shot at it. But you can also specify a JavaScript callback, in which case, only that JavaScript callback will be called with that message. Because both models, you know, some models are good in some cases, and sometimes you just want a single callback. This is the part where you hook in and control what channel someone can see. So if you are, uh, for example, if you just were 
uh, had an, uh, a channel which you just wanted to add to everybody, um, then you build up the array and return it. And basically, after all of the hooks that implement, uh, all of the modules that implement this hook are called, that is merged together. And that is the list that that user is allowed to see. So you get passed in the user who's been authenticated. Uh, you iterate it over. So for example, if you had <coughs> organic groups and you wanted to give them a list of channels associated with the groups that they were in, uh, you could do that. Again, just standard Drupal code. So you, know, you can do anything, basically. All you've got to do is return the list of channels for that user. Another thing that, uh, that's like a primitive that's provided by the module is a content token. So the concept here is that uh, it's not just, it's not on every page um, or, or every socket that, that wants to see a message. So for example, if I was looking at the watchdog page um, and I had a, like something in the back end that sent messages every time a new watchdog uh, entry was, was written, and the intention was to update that table in real time, there's no point sending that down when someone's on a node page or someone's on the user page or whatever. I only want to send it down when they're on that page. So you can set a, a token and it's sent down to, to, uh, to the client in the page load. And then when they connect and say, hey, I want to open up a socket, uh, that token is sent back to Node.js. And then basically it's matched up in the last call down there to send a message to that content channel. And only sockets that are connected to that page will see the message. Um, so this can be used to do the watchdog thing. It can be used to do a block that's only generated for some parts of the site or for some users. Uh, it can be used to send a message down that updates a node. You only want to send that down if someone's looking at the node, right? Otherwise, there's no point. Um, it can be used to update views, et cetera. So again, it's about providing powerful primitives um, for, for people to use with this module. Um, it, it's not the intention to actually come up with a whole bunch of use cases. So um, the, the module itself, um, 1.0 is nearly here. Um, it's actually very stable now. Um, I, I guess I'm just being a bit slow in pushing it out to 1.0. It's been on the, uh, like light, late betas for quite a while, and I would be, I would recommend it as being stable enough to use um, in production environments now. Chat room module uh, is being ported. Um, in the process, I'm gutting a whole lot of uh, code that's got nothing to do with Node.js. It's just to do with Drupal 7 and. Um, getting rid of any stuff that looks like it was written in 4.6, which is when I first wrote the module. Um, so there's a lot of non-Node.js um, stuff going on there. But also, the module is very much being written to, re to pull out anything that is written around the old idea of polling. Um, because you write something like this very differently if you've got a push-capable backend versus how you would do it if you've got, you have to deal with polling all the time. Um, it's, it's written very differently, and it's much better, actually. Also, the Node.js code. Um, there's a branch, if anyone wants to get into this, called Node.js Refactor in the, in the, uh, the Git, a, a, a Git branch um, in the module. And that's basically taking all the stuff that just runs in Node.js and putting it on GitHub uh, as a separate project so that people can install it in, on their server uh, using a package manager that comes with Node. Um, there's a package manager called NPM, Node Package Manager, and it's now bundled in the core of Node. So if you install Node, as in Node.js, you get NPM, which means if, if you write your code so that it's NPM installable, then installing just becomes NPM install, and that's my biggest problem so far. I don't know what to call it. So uh, if anyone can think of a name to call uh, the Node.js only part of this, come and see me afterwards. Um, so that's, that's kind of what's coming. Uh, views integration, there's someone who recently started some issues and posted some patches. They're not ready yet, um, but I would like to build something which allows people to, where a view is being shown on a page using the content tokens I spoke about before, um, allowing that to be updated whenever anything interesting in the view um, is updated. I think that's something that's it's 
a lot of people would use that. Um, so that's kind of on the way. Same with um, entities. Uh, and entities use all over Drupal, and it would be nice to have a kind of like a hook that is, is uh, integrated into node, uh, sorry, into entity updates and CRUD operations, uh, and that you could easily hook into uh, and send messages out, again, using the content token um, idea. And your module here. I, I know of a few cool projects that are, are using it. I know of a company in Philly that's using this to integrate with a health service where people in their homes have uh, Android devices and the Android devices connect to Drupal and send messages like blood pressure okay, blood pressure okay, whatever. Uh, but occasionally they'll send a message like fallen over, heart stopped, whatever. Uh, and the way they deal with that is they have health workers sitting in front of a web UI which is connected um, with sockets to, to Drupal using this module. So that as soon as something happens, a message is sent down to their UI and, and, and they have to react straight away. Um, they wanted it to be web-based so that it was, uh, that for a whole lot of other reasons why they want it to be web-based, um, but this allows them to have real-time uh, notifications just using a browser, um, and that scales really well for them uh, in a lot of other ways. Okay, so now I want to do a demo. Uh, and then uh, we can get to questions. So just bear with me while I line up this tiny browser. Did I mention that I hate Max? I hate Max. Don't you hate? Not much. <laughs> uh, right now, one of these, unfortunately. Okay, so I just wanted to show off some of the basic um, features of the module and a little um, demo of, an, of the sort of example that I hope more people, the sort of modules that people will use uh, right to use the Node.js um, functionality. So first of all, um, some of the things I was talking about before, uh, there is a module that ships with the Node.js which uh, integrates with reports. So a whole bunch of stuff. Um, if I log out, then I get a message. Um, it's pretty ridiculously fast because a lot of the delay that you see when you're looking at a web page is not about the network, right? It's about rendering the page. When you've got that step skipped and when you've got the socket open to start with, um, the, at the top where I was logging out, the next page which says, hey, you've logged out, takes longer than to, to render in the other browser than the message just gets sent down um, to the other socket. Um, and you see that a lot. In fact, sometimes um, we used to not exclude um, the socket uh, that was, uh, say, part of saving a node from getting a message saying, hey, the no node has been saved. And so it would, before it had even kind of uh, finished, you know, when you post and then there's a, a slight gap and then the new page, a message would appear and then disappear um, because it was quicker um, than the actual page being rendered. So that's, that's a simple demonstration. Y you can also um, subscribe to nodes with this module. Um, and this, this is, again, it's just a simple kind of demonstration module that comes with it. So here's um, this node. Uh, let me log in. OK, so I'll unsubscribe. Basically, you know, this is where there's a list of channels in, the, in uh, the Node.js server process, and Drupal can read and write to that and add people or take people out of channels um, based on events that happen in Drupal. So if I go and subscribe to that, and then as an admin, I go, you know, whatever, um, and update it, then I get a little message here saying, hey, that's been updated. Now this is where, this is a bit, in some ways, this is kind of clunky. I'm looking at this node, and I get a message saying, hey, this node updated, which is not exactly the right user experience, which is 
kind of where the generic entity update stuff um, that I was talking about comes in because it would be great to actually push that update down and just update the page or say or do something a little bit smarter. Um, there is one issue here which is that a node is not a node depending on the user. So you might render more or less of the node depending on the user. You might have a different filter uh, on the output depending on the user. So this, when you push down a content token, um, there's a, a way of saying, well, this is, this is for the same for everybody. Or there's a way of saying this is only the same if you're anonymous. And if you're not anonymous, um, then your JavaScript should actually then go out and fetch the page as you, because you might have a different look uh, on that piece of content than an anonymous user or someone with less privileges. Um, so the last thing I wanted to show was just a kind of quick, dumb auction demo. Um, who here hates trying to bid for something where you have to kind of refresh the page because you're getting close to the end and you know, um, and you don't you don't want to lose out? Well, this site sells really nice stale cheeseburgers, um, and so it's just a very simple form. Uh, the module itself, I might just uh, try and do this quickly because it works better like that. Um, yeah, so it's just a, it's a, it's a very, very simple module that just uh, responds to this content type being updated uh, and sends down a message, again using the, the content token idea, to anyone who's looking at that um, at looking at that item. So, and I have pretty crappy uh, JavaScript uh, like front end skills in general, so it doesn't look the greatest, but the idea is that someone can come in and go, oh, actually, that's a really yummy burger, um, and bid now at 25, and the other one just updates. Um, and it's kind of the, uh, the idea of the sort of things that you can write where, again, it's all about it happening right now. Um, and you should ask yourself that question when you're using this module. If it's not about it happening right now, you don't need this module. You should do it some other way. Um, but if you do want to have that instant, um, then this is the module for you. OK, well, that's it. Um, I think we've got, how long have we got for? It's how long? 13, awesome. OK, so uh, yeah, that's kind of the end of the um, talk and demonstration. So we'll open it up for questions. Hi, first uh, stupid question. Actually, uh, I, I assume Node.js runs as a server somehow. I yep. mean, you talk to something, so yep. uh, you, how do you start it if, if you uh, run your module? Does it need to be started? It, how can it be started? Okay, so uh, it does need to be started. It is a separate server process. Nothing to do with your Drupal infrastructure. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I want to move it into something that you can install with the standard Node.js tools. Uh, Node.js is quite young and it's kind of growing up. And um, there are ways that you can kind of do what the, the old school thing of trying to hook it into, you know, init D or whatever the sort of newfangled ways of um, starting processes are these days. Um, I actually like to use Supervisor D um, because uh, you often want to, ha Supervisor D is, is a process that looks after other processes and you can write a configuration about that process. Um, so I, I tend to write for each node process that I want to have run and watched. Um, I, I have some code which will generate the Supervisor D configuration and then call into um, Supervisor D. It has like a control process that you can say like, you know, add this file and start looking after this process. Um, that's how I do it. There are some node only um, watcher scripts. So if you've got node, you don't need to install Supervisor D. You can install some modules and then tell them about your other node processes that you want to have watched and run run. Um, and that's how you do it. But it is kind of new. Um, if you install node, you don't, like a lot of people still install node from upstream, like because the packages are often quite behind and you don't want to be behind right now. Um, so yeah, it's, there's still a few sharp edges because it's not the sort of technology where you just go out and get install Apache and you've kind of, it's all integrated into Debian and Ubuntu and Red Hat and et cetera. Does that answer you? Yeah. Um, uh, 
does it need a separate board for site? Uh, so it's, it's the standard TCP thing, so it needs a separate port per IP port combination, right? So it needs to, um, it needs to, needs to bind, so it has that normal, if you've got a whole load of IPs you can use, then you can use the same port and hit people on different IPs, but mostly you would use a different port. Um, right now the, the, the way it's written is there's a, um, like one Node.js process per Drupal site. Um, in the refactor branch that I mentioned, um, I've rewritten it so that you can have a single kind of supervisor node process with a list of these servers. Uh, Node.js is kind of ridiculously easy to just go, you know what, I'll start out and I'll have none of these going, and then I'll send a, H you know, a back channel HTTP request using an API, please open, create one of these and start listening for me. Um, and that's a model I'm moving to, to, to handle the sort of mass hosting situation. Um, so yeah. Um, how does it handle sort of a concurrent session for the same user? So for example, you had the watchdog page open and yep. then in another tab, let's say you log out, would yep. you still be receiving updates on the watchdog page? Or is it aware enough to close that session for so, you? So that's a good question. So um, there's the capability when you first log in, you get a list of channels that you're allowed to see. Uh, and then in subsequent requests, you don't hit Drupal because I've, I've already authed you. But then what happens if I log out? Um, it's, it's more than that, what happens if I shut down your access to something and you're still logged in? So you can, like, via an API that's not related to a login, you can say, this user now has access to this extra channel or doesn't have access to this channel anymore. Um, when you log out, we uh, intercept a hook in Drupal code and send a message over to Node.js saying, hey, this person, kick them off. Uh, you can also do that not associated with a logout. So you can log into a server and run a drush command and just kick someone off, um, which is, can be kind of fun. You can also send messages that way. <laughs> um, but yeah, you do have to be aware that there's kind of a, there's different life cycles going on. Um, and the, the, num the number of sockets you have is equivalent to the number of tabs that you have. So, um, you know, you share the same session between tabs in the same browser. In a separate browser, you have a new, a new session. Um, but even with just one browser, if you have 10 tabs, you've got 10 separate sockets. Um, and they, they'll keep going until, until you do something about it. Uh, yeah? That's the point where Node.js um, excels over alternatives because it doesn't matter how many tabs and sockets you have running, Node.js just doesn't care. It's not. It's going to scale and handle that well. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, caveats, right? I mean, I, I've tested this up to like about four or five thousand concurrent, uh, and then you know it's another Node.js process that basically opens a whole bunch of sockets because um, socket IO can you can write clients in JavaScript that runs in, in Node.js to connect to other, so you can write the front end and the back end in Node.js. So I've written a test bed and it, uh, like beyond 5,000 goes okay, and then I stop caring. Um, <laughs> and, and basically programmatically send a whole bunch of messages and like disconnected and connected, um, and, and it worked fine. It is definitely not something that just answers all your questions. If you've got a really big site, as the, the code I've got written now is probably like really big, like not just, oh, I've got a big site, but a really big site. Um, because it, <laughs> big, <laughs> a lot of people say, I've got a big site, and 10 requests a second. Anyway, um, so it is a single process. So there are all of the, like, it's not going to just scale forever. Um, and Node.js uh, Socket IO has uh, built in like a Redis backend so that uh, you can keep track, like, if you don't use Redis, it keeps track of a list of sockets in memory, right, in a single process. That's not going to scale forever. So you can use a different backend to keep track of that list in Redis. Uh, uh, and that is something which can scale better. And then you've, you've got to do more work um, in how you connect if you have multiple Node.js processes. So you might use whatever sort of, uh, whatever approach you want to do to have some clients connect to one Node.js process and some clients connect to another. Um, 
I haven't tackled that yet because no one's come along and said, hey, we've, we're running the examiner or some really, really big site and we actually want to use this, but we can't do single process. Um, so there's definitely a way forward using a Redis backend, um, but right now, what you get on Drupal.org in the Node.js process, I will confidently say it'll get to sort of five, 6,000 concurrent users because I've actually tested that, um, but beyond that, I don't know. But again, if you, um, a very small percentage of sites on the internet have 5,000 people on right at the same time. Um, that's not, many, not that many sites. So most people don't need um, beyond that. Uh, you may have addressed this because I came in late, sorry. Um, your client your, your JavaScript client in your browser is opening a socket connection back to your Node.js, correct? Right. Do we have firewall issues when that happens? No. Uh, um, for like strict corporate outbound connections can get cut off if they're not HTTP That's 80, true. port 80. Yep. yep. Um, so that could be an issue? It certainly could. Okay, um, yeah. <laughs> Did everyone get that? So, you know, sometimes you're, if you're at a hotel or whatever and they only let you have like HTTP or whatever, um, that can be an issue. Um, but of course, most people who run this won't run their Node.js process necessarily on the same server or the same IP, listening on the same IP as their um, website, uh, in which case they can just listen on 80, uh, but just listen on a different IP and then you're fine. Right, so the comment was that you can also, if you don't have to use HTTPS for your site, then you can uh, listen on 443 um, and, uh, and get around it that way because most people, uh, uh, most places allow you to go outbound on 443. So I'm kind of near the end. Is there any other of the time, any other questions? Um, with the um, example where you had the user logout mm -hmm. and the reports show that up, um, you were using a Drupal hook to detect the user logout, right? Yes and you sent the message from... Oh, sorry, actually, it's the watchdog. So it's an implementation of hook watchdog. Yep, okay. Um, what JavaScript did you need to add to the reports page to make that line come in? Uh, it's in the Node.js underscore watchdog module. Right. Uh, and it uses, um, uh, do you know, you know Ajax commands, which kind of ships with Drupal core? So yep. there's a Node.js underscore Ajax module, which uh, like integrates with that, so you can write code that will be run as if um, it was a, an Ajax command in the browser. Right. So um, it, it's pretty neat, actually. It's a little bit of a, it was a bit of a hack getting it to work, um, but it allows you to just kind of interact where in, in Drupal um, module code where you would use some of the Node.js Ajax command code, you can kind of use it in the same way. Um, and it allows the stuff like, you know, inserting at a certain point in the DOM or whatever, which, which is already there in Drupal core, so you can just reuse it. Um, the thing about that watchdog thing that's a hack is that um, because of where you, because you uh, can't make any assumptions that that about the back end um, that's, that's writing the watchdog message, um, some of you might, might have noticed there was no link, you couldn't click on it. That's because when you get access to that hook, the row hasn't been written in the database table yet, so you can't work it out. Um, if someone really wanted to, they could kind of have that happen with a separate request later and actually put the link there. but. Okay, we've got time for one more question. Okay. You mentioned uh, testing Node.js on a few thousand users. Yeah. And uh, currently, a lot of government projects, big one, turning away to something like SharePoint because they use, uh, it actually runs for more users at the same time. So I'm just wondering, did you use specific hardware requirements or was it just a normal server you actually? It was a VM on my laptop. Oh really? Yeah, um, it's it's very, I mean, it's very lightweight um, because what I do with Node is a little bit of bookkeeping, like keeping lists of who's already been authenticated by Drupal, mm. and then all the rest is I/O, and and it's all I/O over the network. So that process spends a really large part of its time just waiting for stuff to happen in terms of a CPU. <laughs> so um, it goes a long way um, with just a single process. All right. Thanks. 
All right, that's about all the time we have. Uh, if you'd like to thank... Uh, I forgot your name. Justin. Justin. <laughs>